Hello, my friends. I want to explain the real purpose of mood elevation in limbic impairment recovery in a really big way. This is going to be kind of a long video because this is the one of the most important parts of recovery and it's so not emphasized and that needs to change, especially when it comes to later stage. So I'm going to kind of go over the purpose of, of mood elevation in a small way in recovery and how that translates into a habit, habits and lifestyle in later stage and in maintenance. Because this is the part where a lot of times I'll get on a calls with people and ask them if they elevate their mood and they're like, oh, well, I can't do any of the things I really care about or, oh, no, I haven't really done that. And there's kind of this like, nah, that's kind of an inconvenience, like who has time for that kind of thing. And this is literally the bread and butter, like mood elevation is your feet, it is your legs, it is the thing that's going to carry you forward and keep you going in your life. And I want to explain why as well. Um, and it's also really key that in recovery, because most, for most people, the things that bring us joy were, are crosswired. That's usually how it goes in recovery, that whatever you are passionate about, whether like anything from your work to a certain hobby or something like exercise or, um, you know, certain activities you did with friends or, you know, being a foodie or something like that. A lot of times those things have, have been taken away from us. And a huge part of mood elevation and recovery is learning how to connect directly to joy and pleasure and calm from our senses in a way that isn't connected to anything specific. We're really connecting with the embodied way that human beings from when we're very, very young, like when babies are born and they grow from, you know, little tiny infants into toddlers, we learn how to find joy just through our senses, you know, through visual things as we learn how, as our vision gets better and we, we start to see and we see our parents' faces and we recognize shapes and we, you know, babies will smile at, at beautiful patterns or beautiful faces, um, things like warmth and pleasant sounds, things like that. We're really connecting on a, a sensory level to things that create an innate joy and calm and regulation it's it, we're sending signals of a safe environment to the brain and nervous system which naturally creates a sense of calm a sense of engagement with the brain a sense of joy or pleasure or happiness or wonderment or laughter um, something positive along those lines so that's when i say mood elevation that's largely what i mean is is reconnecting with our human roots of what creates joy in the human person on a universal level beyond your unique um, hobbies and things that you've identified with and that's a big part of recovery as well is that usually we not usually always we need to expand upon our identity and change the foundation of who we see ourselves as in order to recover without fail we have come to see ourselves as defined in a way that isn't complete and it's actually got us cut off from our full self and our full ability to generate joy and, and positive neurochemistry. It's a huge part of recovery. We, we've defined ourselves by illness. We've defined ourselves by our accomplishments or our role that we play um, or our limitations or, you know, whatever, what doesn't matter, our art, our artistry, our voice, our something. And then a lot of times in recovery, whatever that thing is, you lose it and you have no sense of self anymore, which really inhibits our ability to see ourselves as good or limitless or find happiness. So all that said, I'm going to explain, I'm going to use because theory is, is very intangible. So I want to talk about like practically what I did. And I really want to emphasize, I do not want or expect you to do what I did or use the mood elevators that I used. I just want to show an embodied example, an ex like an experiential thing of how I went from this was a practice in recovery to now this is how it's part of my life. So take this and use it in your own life. Apply the idea, the concept of creating these habits and keeping them and integrating them into your life as part of a lifestyle, but they're going to be very different. They're going to be unique to you. They're, they're not going to be mine. So I'm not telling you to do these things, just using my, my journey as an example. So I wrote down a pretty long list of the things that I did to elevate my mood in recovery and how I've integrated that into a lifestyle and how that's enabled me to progress in my recovery and stay recovered because mood elevation is so key to maintaining recovery your brain and this world are not on the side of you staying in joy or calm or meaning or connected to your values or connected to your senses or connected to your true self or connected to God or whatever you want to stay connected with, however you see it. Your brain is here to help you survive by pointing out what's dangerous and the world is going to monopolize on that. So 
it's your job to keep yourself in dose <laughs> and you can create habits so that it doesn't take so much effort. And that's what this is all about. So the number one principle goes back to what I just said about, you know, essentially cultivating an attitude of detachment when we're pursuing mood elevation. And what I mean by that is that you're maintaining neutrality towards how you find the thing, towards the form of it. You know, do I find joy via, you know, running or playing this sport or doing this activity or, you know, accomplishing this much or having this identity as being a really good parent or really good at my job or really high earning. We're saying, no, I find joy through anything. Like whatever the form is, I'm going to practice finding, practice detachment and say, I can find joy in this, you know, this piece of this color of something, this piece of art, just finding the essential wherever you are, however the goodness is coming to you that you receive it open-heartedly without any attachment to how you're finding that joy at all. So anything can bring, because anything can bring you joy, just like babies, just like toddlers, like anything can bring you joy. You still have that capacity inside of you and you can awaken that capacity with your intention. So intending to find, setting an intention to find joy or to find laughter or beauty or connection or love or whatever, setting that intention is how you then can start to connect with those things in really simple ways. So the things I use, some of these you may have heard before if you've been around for a bit, music was a big one. And I cultivated different types of playlists. I had several different, um, and I have them on my Spotify if anybody wants to, if you want them. I've got like meditative, you know, beat based, lo-fi beats type stuff. Um, I had ones for for me, U2 and Coldplay were like the, the bands that my brothers introduced me to when I was like 11 and 12. and. I grew up with them. You know, those bands have been around since, well, well YouTube, since long before I was born and um, Coldplay as well. So those I have like kind of in the newer ones for energy. So kind of mood elevation is really about learning how to meet yourself wherever you are and bring yourself to a place of wholeness and balance. So I have playlists for like every mood for whatever purpose I need. I've got something for that. I watched a ton of improv. Whose line is it anyway? I just watched it and rewatched it because for me, it was really funny, but it also taught me that anything can be turned into a game and that there is no such thing as being too old to be silly. I was like, these grown ass men are getting paid. Their job is to make fools of themselves on national television. That's what they do for a living. And like, you know, these, the cast has been together forever. So they started doing this probably when they were in their twenties and then like up to in their fifties on a stage in Las Vegas, still just making absolute ridiculous fools of themselves. And that's it. And it's just the most beautiful, like the level of connection, the level of confidence and detachment and play and, and creativity. It just taught me anything can be turned into a game. Everything could just, everything is Play-Doh. Anything that happens, anything somebody says, it could seem like a bad thing. But with improv, it's like the magic potion of alchemy where you can just turn anything into a game, anything into laughter. So I, I incorporated that into my lifestyle a lot. Um, dance was another one and I, I lost the ability to dance when I injured my core muscles. So that was one I've kind of kept in different ways. I spent a lot of time in my recovery focusing on my senses, like you know, waking up in the morning or meditating or going to bed at night and just focusing on the feeling of the bed supporting me, the sense of comfort and weightedness of the blankets, just feeling really, really loved by that sense of warmth, really safe, really held. Um, same thing with sunlight, just really practicing slowing down, noticing light, watching light while I was also paying attention to my senses or listening to music and just really slowing my attention down to let all the goodness in and just lock into shapes, colors, light, sensation, that sort of thing. I know that sounds really simple, but it's actually played a huge role in maintaining a sense of safety in the years since my recovery, um, especially because I went through another perfect storm afterwards. Tapping and self-touch. So another practice I did in recovery was I would listen to beat-based music and I would tap along to it. Like I'd pick one of the instruments and tap a lot of times on my chest, sometimes on like my thighs or my knees or kind of on shoulders, you know, even on my face, like just anywhere it felt good. It wasn't a technique I learned, I just was like, this feels good. And it, it forced me to focus on the beat enough that not only was my brain engaged, but I had to follow it. And then I could feel it on my body too. And so there was a, it was like everything got engaged and got my, my brain pattern synced up into a rhythm again. Rhythm is regulation. That goes a long way. Um, and then like just things like hand on heart, hand on belly, or I made a habit after a long time to just kind of go like this. And I would just kind of rub like on my sternum. 
And I would notice myself doing it all the time, like the couple of years after recovery, when I moved out after divorce, I would just be walking around at Costco with my kids being like, it's okay, honey, you're safe. You're safe, everything's all right, we're okay. And, and that was another one, like self-talk, just having, realizing, like I tuned in to whatever my brain needed to hear, or my inner child needed to hear and made it a habit to keep that going and, and just keep it. And that, that was like bread and butter. I had the flu the other day and just the whole day, it was like, you're gonna be okay. We're okay. I know this is a lot. It had been a really rough weekend already. I was by myself. I really wasn't feeling good. It was just like constant. It really makes all the, like that's what carries me through still. So those little things, do not underestimate them. They're very, very, very powerful. Um, another one for me, get makeup and dressing up were something I picked up in recovery because I didn't used to do it. So fashion and self-expression through that, for me, it was a way of saying I'm showing up as my best self even if I don't feel that way I'm gonna put my best self on so that like I have put on my highest self today I am going you know there were some of my worst days I'd put on my prettiest sundress I'd get my best makeup my best jewelry I'd like just just try to make everything as perfect as possible and that has saved my life so many times I cannot even tell you um, my fashion sense and wardrobe have been built out of my worst days because I needed it I needed it um, ironically the days I feel good I usually go less because I'm like, well, I already feel good. I don't need to, I don't need to cheer myself up. Um, but that was something I never did before. So that was a new habit that I picked up in recovery. Um, finding connection. I've done most of my journey by myself. So this is not everybody, but I will say that this practice of mood elevation is that much more important when you don't have a lot of intimate relationships, because you are the only person who's going to comfort you when you're struggling. And that was the case for me for almost my entire recovery and post recovery. I've been, I've been it for like 99% of the time. So that kind of thing of having, um, I connect a lot with musicians and artists. Like that's how I've always connected with other people. The most is just realizing like, this is a real human being with real life experience that made this song, that made this movie, that wrote this poem, that wrote this book, that did this podcast. And that is so real. And it's also the, the love of like my brothers who introduced me to those artists. And like, I've learned more from Chris Martin and Bono and Lin-Manuel Miranda and Viola Davis and Beyonce and like all these artists, I like study their work and study their work ethic and you know, their bodies of work and their albums and their films and just all of it. And it's, it's been such an incredible source of comfort and inspiration. Like the generosity these people have and just, pouring themselves out like that is insane so for me that was huge and that's kept me going you know kept me staying connected inspired me given me guidance wisdom a, you know a really swift kick in the ass if i need it bono's a great coach man i listen to his stuff and i'm like oh that's right this is not or uh jack johnson another great great one just if i'm like okay i need someone to remind me that this is not all about me and there's a bigger picture at play here and those guys are great for that uh, meditation and developing relationship with God. I have a very unique relationship with God. Um, we could write a whole book about that, but that developing that really in detail, that's been huge for me and keeping it up. Um, implementing a perspective as another one. Like there were days, you know, in recovery where I really would focus on receiving, receiving everything. Re everything is love to me. Like really seeing and receiving my kids' faces, every little bit, every color, every ray of light, everything like putting on these kind of glasses for a day and just being like today I'm just receiving or today I'm choosing love you know especially going through a perfect storm while I was still working and, and coaching people who you know I was going through worse stuff than my clients a lot of times too you know after recovery so it was it was rough but I would I would pray before I got on calls and choose the intention of love I'd be like all right my intention is love or my intention is to learn I'm going to give this everything I've got know that I can't control the outcome of this call and say you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to learn something, you know, I'll, I'll do what I can. I'll, I'll give what I can. And I'm going to learn something about my, this person, about the journey, whatever I can. But those perspectives help to keep the pressure off, right? Because a lot of times if we're, the pressure gets so intense to achieve your recovery or do a really good job at work. And it's like, all right, well, you can't force a good job, but you can set the intention to offer wisdom or love or compassion or to learn something that's something I could accomplish so I'd set little intentions so I had something a, a goal I could hit that day even if the rest of my life was out of control I could hit that goal for myself that day or in that coaching call like just make it really small 
that helps immensely with creating dopamine hits with things that you can actually control instead of focusing on things that are that are outside of control. Um, and those things are are things that I've you know kept going, like create a, a lifestyle around that where now it became intuitive over time as to knowing whether in a given moment do I need to sing? Like sometimes just singing, the act of singing stimulates your vagus nerve. So sometimes it's like, I need to turn my music on and actually sing, not just listen, but like sing until I feel all of this pent up stress energy release in my body. Or do I need to lay down? I, I did a lot of body work. Um, so, you know, do I need to mobilize? Do I need to stretch and sit with the tension? That was another big pattern I did later in recovery was I would get on my bolster and do some like psoas release or really get into my hips or my shoulders where I was holding the tension and really get into like, what is this tension? What am I holding on to? What am I thinking that I'm can, that I'm controlling here that I can't control? Like, what is it? Because my body's holding on to something that isn't serving me. And as soon as I get my body in a position to release the tension, it's like I could, it wouldn't let it go. And I'd be, have to be like, all right, what is this tension made out of? What am I holding on to? And there's so many different things over time, but that was another mood elevator because it was a release pattern of releasing beliefs, releasing stuck emotions, releasing attachments to things, you know, emotional attachments, but through the body because we hold those things in our body. Uh, walking is something, you know, I kept doing every day. I've always done that. And setting intentions before I would take a walk of like, what's my intention? Is it to connect to my intuition, to connect to God, to just notice the pretty things and stay in the moment? You know, notice the flowers, notice the roses, notice the snow, the, the cold air on my cheek, you know, whatever, dance down the street, whatever it was. And, and those things have been just literal lifelines, you know, doing the self hug. Like there's been nights where I was just scared and alone and I just hugged myself while I cried till I fell asleep. And it, that makes all the difference in the world because I felt safe, right? I was tired and I was scared and I was alone and I didn't know how I was going to make it through, but I was safe. And that's the biggest thing too. The last thing I'll say about all these things is, you know, a lot of people have been like, wow, you're so strong. You've made it through so much on your own. And I have, like, I look back and I'm like, damn, I don't know how I did that. But technically I do know. And it's actually, it's this, it's understanding that when you are relaxed and all the, everybody, like all Eastern philosophy um, and, and like martial arts talk about this. And it, anybody who knows deep wisdom understands this. It's talked about a lot. This is not a new concept, but actually applying it is something that most people don't do. But because it's hard. It's really hard. Like your brain's going to want to tell you that being scared and worrying and asking someone else what to do is going to give you answers. And I realized yesterday, I was like, another person has never given me the answer. I always got the answers by relaxing, getting into joy, getting into this state of detachment from everything, realizing what's outside of my control. And when you're in that place of expansion and stillness, that's when the that's when you know the answers. You can see things for what they are, and then you know what to do. And you also have the brain function to do it because you're in dose and your nervous system's relaxed. And that is a number one method I've used for, you know, going through a perfect storm after recovery, going through divorce, recovering from narcissistic abuse and gaslighting, getting a business going, all the business stuff that I've done, it's all been just tapping into my own intuition, raising, learning. I had five kids in six years, then got sick for seven years, six years. And then it was like, all right, here's my five kids and I have no idea how to parent and I'm by myself. And I had to figure out how to parent <laughs> my five kids by myself while still recovering from things. And all of that has like this practice, these practices, and, and there's more, like there's so much more um, that I, I just don't have time to share right now. But this is, this is it. This is what's got, this is, you know, people are like, how do you know what you know? This, this, this is how. There's universal wisdom available to all of us, but it only comes when we are, intending to connect with it and we're really open to actually seeing the truth and being connected to love and to joy and to beauty and to laughter and to all that is good then all of the wisdom of how to create a good life comes to us through that so that's my offering for you today i love you guys see you soon